This video is done in collaboration with Henry the Paleo Guy, ATR1X underscore, Curious Archive, Spino Dude Reviews, and Some Raptor. Check out their channels via links in the description and comment section below. Low poly models in this video were made by Adam Midzuk or Kuzim. They were animated by Cameron, Camzilla94, and by Nyx. Sauropods, or long necks, were the largest things to ever walk the face of the earth. Nothing else has come close. Whether that's because something evolves to curb them before they reach the same size as the long neck dinosaurs, or that the sauropods were just built different, the fact remains that nothing existed before or after them that could compete. The only critters to beat out the land titans are the oceanic leviathans, but that's water, they're cheating. Each new sauropod dinosaur discovered helps to understand the group as a whole, as every single one is fragmentary, with very few considered relatively complete. One of these well-preserved behemoths was yet another South American beast from the late Cretaceous. Come and join me in learning about one of the most complete of the titanosaurs, Dreadnoughtus, the living citadel. Every fossil organism is fragmentary. There is pretty much not a single one that has literally 100% of every bone that was in its body when it died. Kinda gonna happen when bones become fossil over millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions of years. Some animals preserve better than others. That may be due to the environment in which they died and or in which they were buried and fossilized. Other times, this may be due to the type of animal it was. Yet, more differences in fossilization may occur due to the size of the organism. Rainforests are acidic and without stable bodies of water and sediment to bury fossils. Hollow-boned animal skeletons deteriorate faster and easier than solid-boned animals. Larger animals get torn apart and their skeletons scatter to the winds easier than smaller animals. And so, we come to the largest animals to ever live, the sauropod dinosaurs. Those that lived in extremely tropical areas like rainforests left little to no evidence. Though smaller species are less numerous to us, those that have been found are usually more intact than the larger ones. The smaller parts of the body, like the head, are some of the first bits to go. This is unfortunate as the skulls of sauropods are some of the most important parts as they can help place a given specimen into an evolutionary perspective. Lacking a head makes things harder, though not impossible. Sometimes luck strikes and a large sauropod skeleton is found and in great condition. The mother load, or holy grail, so to speak. One such holy grail was found on a fossil prospecting expedition to Argentina in 2004 by a small team that quickly grew as dig seasons went on. Dreadnought for Tis But Discovery Dr. Kenneth Lacovera, professor of paleontology and geology at Rowan University, founding dean of Rowan University's School of Earth and Environment, founding director of the Rowan Fossil Park, and Explorers Club Medal recipient, was surface prospecting on the east bank of the Rio La Leona, which is between Lago Argentino and Lago Viedma, through the Cerro Fortaleza formation of Santa Cruz Province, Patagonia, Argentina, in an expedition back in the summer of 2004. The Cerro Fortaleza Formation, or formally the Pariaike Formation, is a layer of rock dating to the late Cretaceous Epoch. Specifically, it chronicles the Campanian to the Maastrichtian Ages 83 to 66 million years ago. It therefore provides a perfect window of how flora and fauna changed right up until the mass extinction. 
Dr. Lacovera was first to find the bits that would lead to a dig site containing two skeletons of what would end up being one of the most complete titanosaurian sauropod dinosaurs ever found. As Dr. Lacovera said in an interview about this discovery, Our first field season down there was in 2004, and that was a rough field season. We didn't have a road to access the area, so we had to raft down a glacial stream to get to the site. We were about 100 miles off the power grids and couldn't carry many supplies out there, so our rations were meager. We began to find remains of giant dinosaur bones, but they were all fragmentary, and they were, for the most part, preserved with iron minerals. Most of the fragments we found that year were at the top of a mountain. I attempted to get a helicopter from the Argentinian Air Force to extract these bones, and they actually said yes, but the deal fell through at the 11th hour. So, I had to find and hire two teams of guachos with their horses, and we built metal sleds and wooden toboggans to extract that material. The first field season anywhere, there's a lot of pressure to make some discovery in order to justify the projects and return trips. We found enough material that first year to justify a return trip, on the first day of the 2005 expedition, while prospecting for fossils, I spotted a small patch of bones and recorded the location with GPS. We returned a few hours later and began excavating. By the end of the day, we'd exposed about 10 bones of what we would eventually call Trisnortus screnae. Four expeditions later, we had collected 145 bones of this new giant's dinosaur. Initially, when Dr. Lacovera went down to Patagonia, he had gone with volunteers from the University of Patagonia as he had some technicians from the laboratory at the University of Patagonia, which was about a thousand miles away from the field site. When he went back the next year, he took a Drexel graduate student. As Dr. Lacovera continues, The year after that, I took more graduate students and for the first time, a Drexel undergraduate, Alison Moyer, who was a sophomore biology major at the time. I had great trepidation about bringing an undergraduate to such remote field sites. We got down there, and Alison informed me that she had never been camping before, which was probably a question I should have asked earlier. She did great that field season, so much so that I brought her back the next year. She became a leader among the team. In fact, at one point she had kind of gone feral on me, and I worried about whether she would reassimilate into polite Philadelphia society when we got home. Now she's graduated and she's at North Carolina State University working on a PhD in molecular paleontology. And she will be in the vanguard of the first fully trained researchers in this new field of science, so I'm very proud of her. Dr. Lacovera was able to take two Patagonian undergrad students who had previously volunteered on the sauropod dig site project to the doctorate program at Drexel University where Dr. Lacovera had been teaching at the time. Both of the undergrad students then went back to Argentina and are now taking the lead in science in their country through the Argentinian version of the National Science Foundation, the CONACET. When you find a bone in the field, you begin to excavate the rock around that bone. It's very difficult in this size because the rock is like concrete, so we're using hammers and chisels and pickaxes all day. But you try to leave some rock on the bone because the rock has stabilised that bone for millions and millions of years. You want to continue to do that while you transport the bone. And so, we leave a veneer of rock around the bone, and we chop down until we pedestal a bone. And then, we begin to tunnel underneath of it, and we wrap bandages of burlap and plaster around the bone. For big bones like femur, we'll jack it some steel bars into it. Then, eventually, we have encased it in this past cocoon that protects it during transport. Says Dr. Lacovera. How did they get those fossils home? There were so many, and they added up to well over 16 tons. Well, they couldn't be flown, so they were floated there via ocean freighter. When we get it here, we have to open those jackets, much like a physician would open up the cast on a broken arm. And then, we have to very carefully remove the rock that is attached to the bone. Sometimes we can do that with dental tools. Sometimes we have to use these mini jackhammers called air scribes. It's very painstaking work. The bones expand when you take the rock off them, and so you get expansion cracks that form. We use specialized adhesive for paleontology to stabilize those cracks, to infill those cracks, and to make the fossil stable so that it will last for centuries in a museum. All the products that we use are easily reversible with ace time, so that if a paleontologist 200 years from now doesn't like how we did the work, they can reverse it and do it again in the way that they see is best. We also try to make the bones very transparent to future paleontologists. We don't camouflage the pussy, or try to paint the pussy to match the bones. We want them to know what's the original material, and what is the work that we've done. Uh, did you forget something? So, how did they get to take these whole sauropods home? 
most countries in the world have laws that govern their fossil resources. In Argentina, it doesn't matter where a fossil is, it doesn't matter who finds it. When you break the surface on that fossil, it immediately becomes property of the federal government of Argentina, which is fine, and that's how it should be. So, over a long period of negotiation, I was able to arrange an exportation of the fossils for research to Drexel University over a four-year period. The initial loan period was extended in 2013, so this resulted in a lot of great collaboration and cooperation with scientists in Argentina, with the National Museum in Argentina, the Provincial Museum in Santa Cruz province. Soon, we will be creating all these bones and sending them back to their home in southern Patagonia. As you can see in this video, the students, volunteers, and scientists at Drexel University took several weeks to create custom crates to contain 16 tons of fossils. A little over three months after the publication and unveiling of Dreadnoughtus, the students had to say goodbye so the specimens could return home to where they belong. They eventually made their way to the Museo Padre Molina in Rio Gallegos, Argentina, where they remain to this day. I have seen a few photos of the central exhibit space at the Museo Padre Molina, and you can see a display box with Dreadnoughtus fossils in it. It's unclear if those fossils are casts or original specimens. I sort of hope they're casts since they lack a top or railing to reduce potential damage from visitors. Dreadnoughtus merch is now available on the Edge Redbubble. Links in the description and comment section below. Over the four summers it took to remove the fossils from the dig site, two specimens were found, one larger than the other. The larger, more complete, and holotype specimen, MPM PV1156, consists of a chunk of the face and a tooth, two bits of neck vertebrae, a handful of neck ribs, most of the back vertebrae, almost the entire tail, a majority of the dorsal ribs, the left shoulder blade, and left forelimb, except for the hand. It also has both sternal plates, these guys here from the chest, and the entire pelvis. Lastly, the holotype also contained the entire left hind limb, except for chunks of the foot, and the lower half of the right hind limb with a few feet bits. The second specimen, the paratype specimen, MPM PV 3546, a partially articulated postcranial skeleton of a slightly smaller noodle neck. This specimen contains a partial neck vertebra, multiple back vertebrae, and ribs, the top part of the pelvis, seven tail vertebrae, and five tail ribs, all pelvic elements, and the left femur. Sounds pretty damn good. But how good? How complete is this dinosaur? On a total completeness, the animal was 45.5% complete. If you mirror the bones from one side that are missing on the other, then it is technically 70.4%. The other percentage being bones that are completely missing from both sides of the body. The research team who described the remains, a team of 17 researchers led by Dr. Kenneth Lacovera, decided to name the animal Dreadnoughtus shrani. Dreadnoughtus is technically Old English for fearing nothing, but obviously has more commonly been shortened to dreadnought and used for a bunch of ships, specifically the battleships of the early 20th century. Meanwhile, the species name, Shrani, honors the American entrepreneur, Adam Shran, for his support of the research. Due to the somewhat groundbreaking nature of these specimens, plenty of research has been published on them since they were first described. I will eventually go through everything that has been said on these dinosaurs, but we must first start with how the OG team described them. The discovery of Dreadnoughtus helps to provide more insight into the general anatomy of this group of titanosaurs, especially when it comes to the limbs, shoulder blades, and pelvis. The vast majority of the bones from both Dreadnoughtus specimens are extremely well preserved. They were only minimally deformed from the fossilization process, with the hind limb bones being especially three-dimensional. An odd characteristic of the animal was its long neck. Despite fragmentary nature of the neck region, a rough estimate of its overall size can be met, 
thanks to comparisons with other sauropods as well as the types of bones from the neck that were found, one from the end and one from the middle. This gives a good idea of how long the neck would be since the number of neck bones in these types of titanosaurs doesn't change horrifically from one to the other. As such, the neck was rather long for these animals, with a super rough estimate of about 11.3 meters 37 feet. Based on proportions of its bones and comparisons to the proportions of other known sauropods, it may have been able to stretch its neck up two stories. If the missing pieces of the neck and tail are filled in based on known elements from other sauropod dinosaurs, the animal was pretty similar to other titanosaurian sauropods. Dreadnoughtus was a total beefcake. It had a shoulder blade that measured 1.74 meters in length, making it longer than any other known titanosaur. The ilium, the bull-shaped top part of the pelvis here, is also too damn big. The ilium is the largest known from a titanosaur, measuring 1.31 meters. A funny thing about Dreadnoughtus is that it technically had the tallest forelimbs of any known titanosaur. It is only surpassed, and only slightly, by the mahusive forearms of Brachiosaurus, for which it got its name. It did not skip arm day. The reason Dreadnoughtus' massive arms don't look so massive is because its hind limbs were about equal in length, so proportionally, it wasn't long-armed, but just a really tall-legged titanosaur. It was smart, and worked arms and legs, take note, kings. Sauropods can be mechanically divided into narrow and wide-gauged varieties. By this, I mean that the placement of the limbs and feet in association with the hip bones was either narrow or wide. The narrow-gauged sauropods were critters like the diplodocids. Over time, wider and wider-gauged hipped sauropods developed, mostly the titanosaurs. The ball joint of the femur was damn near a 90 degree angle in some of the latest titanosaurs thick in ass. In the case of Dreadnoughtus, though it was undoubtedly wide gauged as well, it had a narrower stance than the armored saltosaurid titanosaurs. Dreadnoughtus was also chadly in how barrel chested it was. Its broad sternal bones created a wide pectoral girdle, which, when combined with the amount of muscle in this area, would have made the animal quite busty. They got that Chris Evans chest going on. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman, 